Hello, good morning. Morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you? Fine, sir. Fine, sir. How are you? Almost sir. more than three months. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Maybe still two weeks to extend. Only two weeks. Uh, okay, so you have get time to read your theory. Okay, try to complete your theory, theory parts. So if you join, we'll complete your uh, this practical expert. Try to revise your. Uh, okay, so uh, today we are discussing about the disease, uh, primary biliary cholangitis. Okay, so you may have heard the term PBC, isn't it? Okay. Yes. Sir. So PBC. Yes, sir. Okay. PBC is initially it is labeled as primary biliary cirrhosis. The older term, still some books there you will get primary biliary cirrhosis, but the term is slightly changed. Although the primary biliary cirrhosis, primary now the term is primary biliary cholangitis. Okay, so why they have this changed the term primary biliary cholangitis? Okay, so it is the biliary diseases. Biliary diseases means it affect the bile duct, especially bile duct are intrahepatic and extrahepatic. So, this is the intrahepatic bile duct injury. The inflammation of the bile, necrosis of the bile duct, so this inflammation is cholangitis. So, it is most of the patient of this PVC, the initial level private bilis cirrhosis, when they have done liver biopsy or other diagnostic evaluations, the majority of patients have no cirrhosis, only the inflammation, necrosis, fibrosis. So, majority of the patient at the time of diagnosis have not evidence of cirrhosis. Okay, histologically. So they have omitted the term cirrhosis and this term cholangitis, primary biliary cholangitis. Okay, so this is one of the cause of liver cirrhosis. If you ask what are the causes of biliary liver cirrhosis, one is primary biliary cholangitis. Okay, so this disease affects the intrahepatic bile duct. Other similar disease is primary, primary sclerosing cholangitis. Sclerosing. In primary sclerosing cholangitis, this is also biliary cause of liver cirrhosis, but in this primary sclerosis, both both the intrahepatic bile duct and extrahepatic bile duct are affected. Okay, this. So this is these are polystatic liver diseases. Okay. So one difference between the what is the difference between the polystatic liver diseases and obstructive liver diseases? Okay. okay. Obstructive liver diseases means when there is obstruction in the bile flow, 
outside the lingua means extra hepatic obstruction. Maybe in the hepatic duct, common bile duct, okay, or at the level of uh, duodenum, ampulla, bladder. Whenever there is obstruction, you can extra hepatic bile duct obstruction means obstetric jaundice. So polystatic jaundice means intrahepatic, intrahepatic bile duct. If you see this picture, okay, if it, this is the liver, this is the intrahepatic bile ducts, okay. So this is a small portion of this bile duct. You see, this is normal bile duct, okay. And this is, you see, this bile duct are inflamed, narrowed, okay. So there is damage to the bile duct, okay. So this is the <clears throat> biliary injury, intrahepatic biliary obstruction, intrahepatic biliary. Cholestatis, the primary biliary cholestatis. Okay, so let us start. I think almost all of you are there. So we are starting. Yes, slide. Okay, now introduction. So this primary biliary cholestatis is the autoimmune disease, autoimmune disease, and basically this affects the middle aged woman. So women are more affected uh, in case of autoimmune disease. Why women are more susceptible for this autoimmune disease? I will tell you later. And in PBC, basically it is characterized by the progressive intrahepatic bile duct damage. Intrahepatic bile duct, okay, in, not extra hepatic, intrahepatic bile bile. And when there is damage to the bile duct, I mean bile duct are the flow of the bile from intrahepatic to extrahepatic, intrahepatic. From biliary canonculi, interlobular bile duct, and intralobular bile duct. Okay. In liver, there is bile ducts. Okay, there is small biliary canonculi, and there is interlobular, in between the liver cell lobule, interlobular bile duct, there, there is canal of hearing. Okay, microstructure. I need to in detail. So interlobular, intralobular, and from their bile um, bile flow into the bile ductules. Okay, and bile duct, intrahepatic bile duct, and then hepatic duct, and the right hepatic, left hepatic duct, and then you come to the uh, extra, extra liver, and enjoying the cystic duct, common bile duct, in this way, bile flow. So, when there is obstruction or damage, a progressive damage of the intrahepatic bile duct, this bile is unable to flow in the biliary canal line. All the bile is stored in the liver. So, when there is stored in the liver, that is, we call that polystasis. Okay. So bile is toxic substance. Okay, the bile is toxic substances. When the bile accumulate in the inside the liver cells, it is canopy, it damages the liver cells. It damages the cholangiocytes. It damages the liver cells. Okay, and all the complications are due to the cholestasis, and this cholestasis damages the liver cells. Okay, it uh, it uh, activates the inflammatory process. It activates the skeletal cells. Then fibrosis, liver cirrhosis. Okay, and finally, complication of liver cirrhosis is portal hypertension, and the complication of portal all the complications of portal hypertension means patient may have ascites, patient may have hepatic encephalopathy, patient may have cell bleedings. Okay, so all the complications. So, so this is the basic. <clears throat> now, if you see worldwide, okay, the it is more common in female. The ratio is nine is to one. So, if you suspect any case of this biliary disease, biliary polyngitis, always that is female. Okay, the ratio nine is to one, and the average age is thirty to sixty years. Although few cases are reported in the early teens, and few cases in the advanced age also, the majority of the populations affected are female, and the ratio nine is to one. Now, why female are more common? This is autoimmune disease. Okay, so why autoimmune disease are more common in the female? Okay, so take a check. Cause in not only there various hypotheses that support this autoimmune disease are more common in female. Okay, do you have any idea? Okay, so female one is that they have hormones, the estrogen hormone. Okay, male has androgen okay, hormones. So the estrogen hormone is basically responsible for the stimulation of the autoimmune immune autoimmunity. Okay, and this uh, androgens have anti uh, autoimmune effects okay so basically the estrogen accelerate the autoimmune diseases or the one factor other is in female they have x chromosome and x chromosome they have two x chromosomes okay so x chromosome the benefit of x chromosome is that female having x chromosome they have less chances of excellent uh, diseases okay, diseases 
but the defect is that that S chromosome is linked to the immune regulation systems. Okay, immune regulation. So having X chromosomes, having estrogens level, they are more susceptible to having autoimmune lymph diseases. Okay, this is the main reason. Now so pathogenesis. So as I have already told in the introduction that this is an autoimmune disease, but exact cause is non unknown. We don't know why it is, but the evidence support that this is autoimmune disease. So autoimmune disease basically occur in those individuals. Those individuals they are susceptible to individuals. They have genetic defects, okay, and the environmental factors. So when the susceptible individuals okay come across the environmental effect, environmental antigens, okay, they may have chances of developing the autoimmune disease. Okay? So in there is autoimmune disease, there is always humoral response, okay, cellular response. Humoral response means there is antibody formations, cellular means the T cell activations, T cells, okay, and T cell finally activate the B cells. Okay. So, this activation of the intense humoral response, cell response to an intracytoplasmic antigen. Okay. In the liver cells, liver cell, there is cytoplasm, there is a nucleus. So, basically, there is this immune response against the intracytoplasmic antigen, especially the mitochondria, mitochondrial antigens. Okay. The mitochondrial antigen, I will tell you the mitochondrial antigens. The mitochondrial antigen is pyruvate dehydrogenase, PD. C complex, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex E2. Okay, this is the mitochondrial antigen, and the antibody against is anti mitochondrial antibody. Okay, so in PBC, when you suspect PBC in a female patient in polystatic liver diseases, polystatic liver biopsy suggests or polystasis, okay, on the symptoms, the antibody test is the first antibody test you do anti mitochondrial antibody. So, anti mitochondrial, mitochondrial antigen, the antibody form against the mitochondrial antigen. That is anti mitochondrial antibody, and this antibody is present in majority of the cases more than 90 to 95 percent cases. Means 95 percent patient uh, or female have this antibody, anti mitochondrial antibody. Okay, so <clears throat> this is this also support the immune diseases. Okay, having antibody. So, involvement the T lymphocyte in the destruction of bile ducts. So, bile duct damage are basically in the T cells when the T cell activated. Okay, they, they, they release the various cytokines and the cytokines activate the inflammatory process, inflammations, and this inflammation may damage the bile duct, okay, intrahepatic bile duct, interlobular bile duct, then, then intralobular bile duct, okay. So, <clears throat> and this is autoimmune diseases. Other evidence in support of autoimmune diseases, if the patient have one autoimmune diseases, they may have chances of having other autoimmune diseases also very high. So there are also other autoimmune diseases. So in case of primary biliary cholangitis, patient may have chances of autoimmune hepatitis, AIH. Okay. So autoimmune hepatitis. Now we have, I have told you in earlier class that in the patient of PVC having AIS, we can from a overlap syndrome. Okay. Overlap syndrome. Different criteria for diagnosis overlap syndrome. There is various criteria. So you do not need at your level. So just remember, autoimmune hepatitis with PVC is overlap syndrome. Okay. Other autoimmune disease are celiac disease, patient celiac disease also having, patient have this rheumatoid arthritis, but there are many autoimmune diseases associated. Okay, so you have to take the history regarding presence of other autoimmune diseases. Other evidence supporting the autoimmune nature is female, female, female are more, this um, autoimmune disease are more common than female. Okay, so this is the pathogenesis <clears throat> in support of the auto, autoimmune diseases. Other things is autoantibodies. Okay? So this is auto, auto, uh, autoimmune diseases. So you will get antibody. So the common antibody, the major antibody is anti-mitochondrial antibody. This is also asking like MCK poisons, anti-mitochondrial. So in major 90 to 90 percent cases. And some patients have primary biliary cholangitis, but absent anti-mitochondrial antibody. That means anti-mitochondrial antibody negative PVC also there. So in that case, you can do ANA also, anti <coughs> ANA, okay, ANA, AMA, this is anti duplicate antibody, okay. So ANA is present in few different cases and 85% cases of the with AMA negative PBC. So anti nuclear antibody, okay, this is mitochondria, this is nuclear antibody. So if you suspect PBC, AMA negative, you can go for the ANA, okay. So in AMA negative PBC, in the 85% cases, you will get ANA is also. Positive for the first case is AMA. So, apart from this AMA, ANA, there are other antibodies okay, produced um, 
uh, other antibodies identified in the case of PBC. These are <clears throat> so these are the mitochondrial antibody. Other is nuclear core protein. Okay, nuclear protein antigens GP two hundred ten. So anti GP two hundred ten antibody is also present in case of PBC. Okay, so you may ask in MC questions. Okay. So this is present in 25% of patients with AMA positive. If the patient AMA positive, it should be anti-GP 210. In 25% will get this positive. But AMA negative PBC, 50%. Okay, you see more present in the AMA negative. Okay, so if you suspect PBC, AMA negative, you go for the ANA and anti-GP 210. So other antibodies is P62, anti P62 antibody. This is basically found 25% cases. But although this, if this is present, it is very much specific for, okay, it's a sensitivity low, but specific for this PBC, anti P62. So these are the antibodies AMA, ANA, anti GP210, and anti P62. These are the auto antibodies against the, uh, this um, PBC. <clears throat> now, genetic factors. So, I have already told you genetic, genetic diseases, autoimmune diseases. So, evidence supporting genetic diseases, there is the first degree relatives. Okay, patient having first relatives have a family. You always ask the family, have you any family? Okay, your mother, okay, your siblings having similar kind of disease or not? If this present is supportive of this autoimmune disease. Okay, and other is it is associated to other autoimmune diseases. Have you? Have evidence or symptoms of other means like diseases, multiple sclerosis. I have told you. Other is genetic factor HLA association, HLA genes. These also the HLA. The human leukocyte antigen it is a protein complex. Okay, this is HLA is a protein complex. Okay, so you have it in uh, microbiology, maybe in detail of pathology. But HLA is protein complex, gene complex, and it is embedded by the MSC class gene. MSC means major histocompatible complex gene. Okay, embedded or encoded by and this encoded covering act as an immune regulation system. It regulates the immune system. The SLA class, MSC class gene, they regulate the immune system. Okay, so evidence of are you listening? Okay, so all I do, okay. Some noise okay. So, first thing is association of the diseases and HLA class 2 gene. These are the genetic factors responsible. Now, other evidence is this apoptosis. Okay, this is all the pathway. Apoptosis. So, what is apoptosis? You all know apoptosis. Apoptosis is a programmed cell death. Okay, there is cell death of apoptosis. Okay. So during apoptosis, the cholangiocytes, like the phytocytic cholangiocytes, during apoptosis, cholangiocytes translocate intact immunologically active PDCE2. So during apoptosis, the cholangiocyte releases the immunologically active compound, means PDCE2. The PDCE2 means pyruvate dehydrogenase complex E2 is a mitochondrial antigens. Okay, so the antibody against this antigen is anti mitochondrial antibody, means anti PDC E2 antibody, the name. Okay, so during apoptosis, this every active PDC is released, and this PDC or this mitochondrial antigen react with the circulating immune complexes. Okay, immune complex, or immune complex that are processed by the antigen presenting cells. Okay, APC, and which present the epitope of T cells. Okay, epitope means antigen presenting cells of T cells and thereby leading to a specific T and B cell activation, activation of T cells, B cells, and, and when the activation of T cell, B cells, the, re the release of the cytokines, the release of the autoantibodies, and this immune complex, okay, immune complex, and immune mediated liver injury, that immune mediated biliary epithelial injury. This is the apoptosis. So the, the, the apoptosis is also involved in the pathogenesis of this PPC. Okay, so you remember, okay. <clears throat> other is, other factor is molecular mimicry. Molecular mimicry means, okay, there are certain uh, infectious agents, okay, in the environment, infection agents, they have protein or peptide 
very much similar to the protein or peptide in the hepatocytes or especially in the cholangiocytes. In the, our liver cells or the biliary cells having molecular peptide very much similar to the infectious agent, especially E. coli and the viruses. Okay, so whenever this infection agent enter in our body, okay, so our body think that they are they are, they are very similar to the, our our body systems, body cells. So they develop first reaction. So they develop antibody against this E. coli and other viruses. Okay, because they have molecular mimicry. Okay? So this is the other reasons molecular mimicry means in patient having susceptible genetic factors, susceptible having PBC, if they are infected with the viruses, okay, okay they, they enhance this autoimmunity process, okay, okay? They, they enhance the disease process, okay. This is the molecular mimicry. Other is genobiotics. Okay, genobiotics are the compound, they are foreign compounds, okay, foreign antigens, foreign compound, and they, this genobiotic foreign compound have different protein structures, or they alter the protein structures, okay, molecular structures. And this molecular structure, alter molecular structure is very much similar to the native protein, means host cell protein, okay. Again, similar like um, uh, this uh, molecular mimicry, there is virus, and there is the other compound, this compound, okay, external compound. Means molecular, uh, this zero battery means external compound or protein, have different structures, but they induce the structures, okay, they induce the molecular structure that is very much similar to the native or host cell protein, okay. Again, there is cross-reaction, this protein, again, development of autoantibodies, and this autoantibody mediated damage to the cells in case of this hepatic, uh, this cholangiocyte damage, okay. Other, there is relation between the PVC and smoking, okay, the patient having uh, PVC, if they are smokers, Okay. They accelerate the disease process, they accelerate the biliary damage, they accelerate the fibrosis, and they develop cirrhosis early. So the relation between smoking and the is um, PBC. So this is about the basic pathogenesis. Okay, means genetically susceptible individuals, okay, when they expose environment agents, either in form of genobiotics, molecular mimicry, and other is formation of autoantibodies. Okay. So this is the flow chart. So <clears throat> already we have uh, discussed this. So genetically susceptible host, okay. So they are unable to suppress T cell attacks on the bioidentical cells. And this T cell made it biliary injury, the progressive damage to the biliary duct epithelial cells. So biliary cell damage means there is the, the flow of the bile is obstructed. So intrahepatic cholestasis, cholestasis. Okay, the bile is toxic substances, and this toxic substance gradually damage the other bile duct. Okay, bile duct damage, and when the bile duct damage, okay, they, they, they also damage the nearby hepatocytes also. They activate the uh, inflammatory process, T cell mediated cytokines, inflammatory process, and this inflammation further activate the hepatic stellar cells. Okay, the stellar cells is responsible for the process of fibros fibrosis. There is the stress activation, there is the collagens. Okay, procollagens, collagens, and I mean they in they um, uh, <coughs> accelerate the process of fibrosis. Okay, when there is fibrosis, there is scarring of the hepatocytes, there is increase the portal pressure. Okay, portal pressure, the development of cirrhosis, and all the complications of portal hypertension means special hepatic failure. Okay, ascites, all these complex. So this is the uh, this is the um, uh, reason. Okay, uh, this is the basic. Pathophysiology uh, in primary biliary cirrhosis. Okay, so biliary damage. Other thing is that liver cirrhosis in this case is due to biliary disease, not liver disease. Primary is the biliary, liver, um, biliary disease. So the liver disease, there are many causes of chronic liver disease, alcohol, B and C. They also have liver cirrhosis. But well, the difference is that in case of this biliary injury, the development of fibrosis cirrhosis earlier than the liver disease. Okay, so in experimental model. Okay, in the experiment, there are experiment certain drugs they try. So these all are done in animals, in mice model. Okay, so the, 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 these mice uh, they made the mice become cirrhotic. So it will take time cirrhosis take 10 to 15 years. So how these mice develop cirrhosis very early? Because the mice hardly 
survived 10 years, huh? they are maybe few months or years. Okay? So they develop cirrhosis in the mice. How they develop is they call it bilirial gene. They call the bile duct, okay, bile duct ligation. That okay? I means they ligate the red bile duct and there is cholestasis and this cholesterol actually has the fibrosis and cirrhosis. So this is the experiment. So this is the flow chart. <laughs> So, <clears throat> what is the natural history of PVC? Okay, PVC. There are four four states. One is silent state. Silent means patient may have PVC but no symptoms. Okay. If you do liver biochemistry also, they are uh, this is normal. Means this patient are undiagnosed. Okay. Unless there is strong family history of PVC, family history of cirrhosis. During the screening, you may diagnose, but other one you can have because they have no symptoms. They don't visit the hospital. It means silent PVC. Okay. Silent PVC. Okay. If you deliver the normal, but if you do AMA antibody, if you do this AMA, AMA anti mitochondrial antibody may be positive, but normal transaminase, ALD, AST normal. Other is asymptomatic. Asymptomatic means although the patient have if you deliver biochemistry, okay. Patients have rise in ALT, AST, especially the alkaline phosphate. Means the cholesterol liver is only the cholesterol liver is the alkaline phosphate increases, GZD increases. Okay, and anti mitochondrial positive, but they are still asymptomatic. So it is very difficult to diagnose asymptomatic silent cases. So they are basically diagnosed when they have done this investigation for any other purposes during screening, during surgeries, okay, or you know, sometimes application of a job going abroad. So when do this case, they found this abnormality, okay, and at that time they are diagnosed, okay. Other are symptomatic. Symptomatic means patient have abnormal liver biochemistry, patient have autoantibodies, along with the symptoms, okay. So what are the symptoms? What are the most common symptoms of PVC? The patient of PVC, the female generally present with the symptoms. There are two important symptoms. One is fatigue, other is pruritus. These are the most two symptoms. This is symptom to the polystatis, okay. So why fatigue or pruritus occur? I will tell you later. And fatigue and prototypes are very early symptoms. And other symptoms are due to the development of portal hypertension. And you know the portal hypertension and their complications. A patient may present with ascites, okay, patient may present with fatigue encephalopathy, diarrheal bladies, okay, anything. And finally, is liver failure. Means this is a decompression liver cellulose. Patients are all the decompression event, okay, the liver death. So this is the stage of primary biliary cholangitis. So in our cases, who hardly get this is not common disease, although this is the most common biliary disease of liver cirrhosis, but this is not common. Okay, not common. So I have only seen two yeah, two or three cases. Okay, not here. Uh, I have seen in India two or three cases. Okay, one case is overlap syndrome, PBC and PS, um, autoimmune hepatitis, and other is purely PBC. So both are female. Now clinical features. <clears throat> so clinical feature means clinical presentation means asymptomatic diseases. Means Average 60% of the patients are asymptomatic, and this 60% diagnose PBC when they have done investigation for any other reasons, like during screening purposes. Okay, so incidental detection or incidental diagnosis, 60% cases, and AMA is positive in that cases, and other important alkaline phosphatase ALP. So when you get the patients, it's female patients, history of pruritus, aging. Okay. And uh, uh, raise organic phosphatase, you can suspect you go for the anti mitochondrial antibody. So, majority patients are asymptomatic. Okay. So, basically, the liver disease, uh, majority of the patients are asymptomatic. Okay. When they become asymptomatic, they don't visit the hospital. So, whenever the patient visits the doctor, they are always in the advanced stage. Okay. So, whenever the patient has liver cirrhosis, 80% liver cirrhosis, they are still asymptomatic. So whenever you get the patient liver cirrhosis, more than 80% have liver damage, 80%. Okay. So majority of patients came in that stage because they are asymptomatic. So what are the symptoms, symptomatic diseases? So <clears throat> the symptomatic is initially the symptoms are due to the cholestasis and thereby complication of cholestasis means that is they damage the liver cells, hepatocytes, cholangiocytes, and portal pressure increases. And the other complications are due to the portal hypertension, as no other disease. So, what are the initial symptoms are due to the polystasis? Means there is retention of the bile inside the liver. When the liver is saturated, the bile, okay, <clears throat> saturated, this effect of bile in the system is circulation. Okay. So, the typical 
patient with pseudomonas disease are middle aged woman with complaint of fatigue and pruritus the most common is fatigue okay fatigue is very important and this fatigue persists throughout the disease course and higher fatigue level have been associated with the end increased risk of death and need for liver transplant so fatigue is very important symptoms fatigue and this fatigue is associated with the uh <clears throat> severe liver diseases if the patient has more fatigue pronounced fatigue means if the liver is very much severe diseases and this fatigue advanced stage of fatigue is also indication of liver transplant okay this is fatigueness is correlated with the severe liver disease all the pruritus is slightly different okay pruritus is present in the initial stage of diseases okay pruritus it is not always present it may be intermittent okay majority patient in the early onset disease have pruritus or in the late stage have pruritus but in sometimes in advanced stages in advanced stages fatigue is present but pruritus may be absent okay other important thing in sometimes patient may be in early stages no cirrhosis for intense pruritus okay intense pruritus that have poor quality of life that is maybe indication of liver transplant generally we do liver transplant in the initial liver disease means patient portal hypertension all the complications portal hypertension then go liver transplant or do not go liver transplant okay but in case of pruritus if the patient intense pruritus okay that affect the patient quality of life in that case you go for the liver transplant patient okay so fatigue persists throughout the course of diseases and also the severity of liver disease severity of liver disease but pruritus intermittent may be or may late okay sometimes absent in advanced cases it is not related to the severity of liver diseases but this pruritus is one indication for liver transplant even the patient liver is normal okay so why patient have fatigue okay fatigue okay fatigue basically occurs fatigue is basically because of the cytokines okay i have already told you this is inflammatory process okay uh, antigen antibody uh, reactions inflammation cytokines interleukins interferon so all these things causes fatigueness this is the cause of fatigueness this, this process going on okay every day every time okay so this is the cause of fatigueness and pruritus itching this is sense is and sense scratching okay why patient pruritus okay so this pruritus is when there is uh, there are many theories okay one is that in the patient <coughs> One is when this cholestasis, when the retains in the bile, okay, the bile mm, in the uh, circulation or the bile causes activation of the efferent cells, efferent receptor in the skin, efferent, okay, efferent receptors in the skin. So they have they are uh, mm, they induce the substance P also, are the nocive safety receptors, okay, substance P. So that may also responsible for the, this itching reaction of pruritus. Other is opioid. Opioid agonist means they this this uh, bile activate the opioid receptors also. So opioid receptors are responsible for itching. Pruritus opioid receptor. So in case of this pruritus, we we'll give you anti opioid drugs. Okay, okay, anti opioid drugs antagonist. Okay, and other important factor is okay there is uh, enzyme this is auto taxin enzyme. This auto taxin enzyme. for this increase release of the lipophosphocatechic acid lpa this is the acid okay so in cholestatic um, hepatitis or cholestatic liver diseases this autotoxin level increases and this autotoxin synthesize or release more amount of this lpa lys uh, lysophosphocatechic acid level and this this is protein in nature uh, proteogenic this may be responsible for the itching so these are the basic theories Uh, why pruritus is common in the cholestatic liver disease? Okay, means one is activation of the opioid receptors, opioid receptors. Other is activation of the nociceptive receptor, substance P in efferent nerve endings. Other is increased level of the lipophosphocatechic acids. Last minute. So, so these are the causes of the um, these are the basic theory regarding why polycystic is common pruritus. So, what are the sim what are the symptoms and sign? Okay, the major symptom and sign is fatigue in pruritus. Apart from this, hyperpigmentation. Pigment means the change in change in color of the skin. Pigmentation. Okay. So, hyperpigmentation is also common. So, hyperpigmentation. Why hyperpigmentation occurs? You know the melatonin. The level of melatonin increases in case of 
this uh, PVC. So I may not increase again is the copper, the relation between copper. Okay, the copper more than 80% of copper is excreted through the bile, bile acid. Okay, and then finally excreted on the feces. Okay, 80%. When there is polystasis, the copper is not excreted. Okay, it is stored in the bile. And when this copper is accumulated in the bile, or unable to excrete through the bile, it activates the tyrosine enzyme. And this tyrosine enzyme is responsible for synthesis of melanin. Okay, this is the reason hyperpigmentation. So, hepatomegal liver illness means initially there is cholangiocytes, cholangitis, and finally there is inflammation of the liver cells. This is hepatomegaly. Splenomegaly is due to if the portal hypertension, there is splenomegaly also. Janthilisma, janthilisma, janthomas. Okay, in PBC, other thing is there. In PBC, the lipid level, hyperlipidemia, lipid, lipid is also increases, lipid level. Okay, so why janthilisma is, is also associated with the increased lipid or fat deposit in the skin. Basically, in the eyelids, you will get this janthilisma. So why there is hyperlipidemia? Okay, hyperlipidemia. So hyperlipidemia is also related to the polystasis. Okay, polystasis. Why the polystasis? Okay, uh, this polystasis causes <clears throat> again this uh, excretion of the uh, this cholesterol from the uh, liver. Okay, cholesterol is also bile induced. So this polystasis, the more cholesterol is absorbed. Okay, this is the reason. There is hyperlipidemia, jaundice. Okay, jaundice again related to the liver injury. Polystasis, jaundice, right upper quadrant pain due to the hepatomegalies. And some kind of asymptomatic. I already told you 60%. So average is 25 to 61% are asymptomatic. So these are the common symptoms sign. Is fatigue, pruritus, okay, hyperpigmentations, uh, clinically, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, you can janthelisma, janthomas. Okay, these are the common symptoms. And other signs are if the patient have already developed portal hypertension, you will get all the symptoms sign of portal hypertension. You may say yeah, that means and ascites, you may have ascites, you may have pulmonary edema, spider nemi. Okay, jaundice, typing tumor, complication, hepatic encephalitis, so everything. So these are the species for earlier sinus symptoms of polystasis. So, or to associate diseases. So, <clears throat> if you have taken the history, if you have sinus symptoms of the PVC, try to find out patient may have other diseases like this is carried out congenital by Sika, okay, Jogren syndromes. Okay, you may okay, you may take the history regarding Jogren syndrome, renal tubular acidosis, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Cholestones, automatic thyroid, automatic disease, PSC. So always try to take the history regarding presence of other automatic disease or not. Okay, because if the patient has one automatic disease, patient having chances of other automatic disease is very high. Diagnosis. So how you diagnose PVC? Okay. So diagnosis is PVC basically on the background of clinical symptoms. Okay, what are the clinical symptoms? Okay, basically you know clinical symptoms, fatigue and pruritus. Okay, and on the background of clinical symptoms, you do. There are other things in support diagnosis. So among these three points, if the two points are present, then you can make the diagnosis on the background of history. One is liver biochemistry suggest of cholestatic hepatitis. So what are the liver biochemistry suggest of cholestatic hepatitis? Is alkaline phosphatase. Raise alkaline phosphatase 1.5 times than normal, upper limit of normal. Okay. Okay. 1.5 times. So alkaline phosphatase is also raised in case of obstructive liver disease also, okay? But there should be no any evidence of obstruction in the bile flow, okay? If there is no gall stones or CBD stones, there should be no uh, pancreatic mass, anything that is ruled out by the imaging. So chronic polystasis with biochemical alkaline phosphate level more than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal, one point. And other very important is antibody, anti mitochondrial antibody. So it should be at least more than equal to 1 to 40. It may be higher. More than 140 also, but at least it is equal or more than 1 to 40. And finally, is the liver biopsy. Okay, liver biopsy very much consistent with the PVC. So, among three points, if the two points are meeting, then you can diagnose PVC. So, basically, we are diagnosed PVC on the background of clinical history and presence of AMA and alkaline phosphate. We hardly do liver biopsy. Okay. <clears throat> The liver biopsy is considered if you are doubt about this um, overlap syndrome. This patient have symptoms of autoimmune hepatitis also and PBC also overlap, then you can do liver biopsy.
So in liver biopsy, there are by liver biopsy you can stage the liver, stage the liver disease, stage, stage staging. There are four stages. One is <coughs> stage one, two, three, four. This is Ludwig histologic staging. Ludwig. So you may just ask an MCQ question, otherwise you no need just remember Ludwig uh, histologic staging. In stage one. In stage one, the disease is characterized by the inflammatory obstruction of the intrahepatic septal and interlobular bile duct. Means very important. Okay, so in liver cell. Okay, so so this is the liver cell. Okay, this is the. Uh, these are <clears throat> okay. You see, these are the hepatocytes. Okay, these are the hepatocytes. Ah, uh, this is hepatocytes. So this is the portal vein. So you know portal tract. Portal time is portal vein. Hepatic artery and bile duct. Okay. So hepatic and bile duct. So initially the bile duct are basically in the this portal tract bile duct. Okay. It's the interlobular bile duct. Okay. Interlobular. Initial first stage of bile duct, biliary canicula and interlobular bile. So they are affected. Inflammation start from the interlobular bile duct, then followed by intralobular bile. Okay. So there is this is also a fluoride duct lesions. The fluoride duct lesion is also MCG questions. Fluoride duct lesion you get in the PBC. Okay. And there is inflammation necros around the this interlobular bile duct. Okay. This is the first stage. Second stage means now this inflammation extends from the interlobular bile duct to the inter uh, intralobular and adjacent the liver cells. The bile duct adjacent hepatocyte. That is interface hepatitis or you also got a piecemeal necrosis, the extension of the inflammation. So initially inflammation first confined to the interlobal bile duct. Now from the interlobal bile duct, it go beyond near the hepatocytes. Okay. And there is an interface hepatitis or piecemeal necrosis. Okay. This is the second stage. Okay. <laughs> so you, this, this thing, okay. This is the uh, portal vein. This is inflammatory portion. You see, okay. And adjacent, they are okay, both are and adherent to each other. So, this is the piecemeal necrosis or interface hepatitis. Third stage is bridging, bridging necrosis. Bridging necrosis means the inflammatory process from the one portal tract to other portal tract. Means there is bridge, the inflammation beyond one portal tract to other part, bridging necrosis, or there is fibrous development. If you see this picture, this is the ladder portal tract. This, uh, this is on a protect. Now the inflammation initially begins here, here in prototype. So it be, go beyond the prototype, interface hepatitis. Now bridging means this fibrosis extends from one prototype, one will be bridging fibrosis. This third stage. And finally is cirrhosis. Means this means all the these liver cells are replaced by the fibrous tissues. Okay, no do This is cirrhosis, cirrhotic stage. Okay. All the fibrous band, the, the, all the liver cells are replaced. By the fibrous tissue. This is stage four cell. This is the Ludwig classification of uh, <clears throat> PBC. This is the histologic. So in majority, we do not go for liver biopsy. Okay. But if you are doubt about diagnosis or if you are suspecting presence of autoimmune hepatitis or you are suspecting PSC also, then you can go for biopsy. So imaging. So imaging is uh, imaging is radiological test. Okay. So we imaging. Is not diagnostic for PBC, okay? Because there is the intrahepatic bile duct. You cannot observe intrahepatic bile duct by imaging. So imaging is done to rule out any other obstructive, um, obstructive bile duct diseases, okay? To rule out bile duct obstructions. Okay. So in external uh, extra hepatic bile duct obstruction, there is also polystasis. There is also raise in bilirubin. There is also raise in alkaline phosphate. Just to rule out the other obstructive uh, bilirubin lesions or bilirubin disease, you do imaging. So the first imaging is ultrasonography. It is easily accessible. It is very non-invasive -in test. Okay, in every every centers and everyone can do this um, imaging. Not radiologists, even a pathologist, gastroenterologist can also do this procedure. Okay, so imaging ultrasound. So ultrasound in non-imaging usually educate to rule out bile duct obstruction. So if you do ultrasound, this is normal ultrasound. Okay. So if obstruction in extra hepatic obstruction in the bile, it is by obstruction in the suppose common bile duct or obstruction at the level of uh, uh, distal bile duct at the level of um, duodenum or ampulla or okay, periambular carcinomas or anything. 
means this is obstruction. If the obstruction distally, this is proximal, means intrahepatic bile duct dilatation. Okay. Okay. So this is obstruction. There is no obstruction. Those intrahepatic bile duct are normal. CT scan. CT scan is generally CT abdomen. Generally indicated when you are not able to rule out uh, any biliary, extrahepatic biliary obstructions. Okay. The patient is fat patients, fat, very much fat, fat deep patient, obese patient. It's very well difficult to, to visualize your this common bile duct. Okay. So CBD lesion or CBD stones are undetected by ultrasound in more than 50% cases. It's very distal CBD. So in that cases, you can do CT scan. ERCP. So ERCP is basically not indicated, not for that. ERCP is usually needed in a obstructive polish or polystatic liver disease. AMA is negative. Okay. Maybe it is case of PSC, primary sclerosing cholangitis. Okay. In PSC, both the intrahepatic and extra bile duct obstruction. So to rule out PSC, primary sclerosing cholangitis, you have to ERCP. In PSC, what is what is happening there? There is the primary sclerosing cholangitis. The cholangitis means biliary duct, biliary channel and become sclerosis. Means there is narrow. So narrowing. Again, dilatation, dilatation, again narrowing. So, beaded appearance, mala, beaded appearance of the bile duct, you can see in the ERC pictures. Okay. Just to rule out this, this PSC, you can do ERCP in AMA negative patients. MRCP also, MRCP is, it is MRI of the biliary channel, MRCP. It is, so in some patient like comorbid obesity, patient not fit for ERCP, you can do MRI. Okay. <clears throat> so these are the investigation, not diagnostic, but to rule out the obstructive lesions. So what are the other differential diagnosis? So this is the cholesterol liver disease. So you have to rule out other cholesterol liver diseases. Okay, or cholesterol biliary diseases. So gallstone diseases. Okay, gallstones. Yeah. In case of gallstone, you may have jaundice. So you may have pain of the mind. Okay, uh, you may have uh, cholesterol liver biochemistry. So you have to gallstone diseases. Different diagnosis. You can rule out gallstone by using imaging. Okay. Other is bilateral obstructions like uh, bilateral obstruction, maybe tumor, cyst, okay? Uh, like in case of uh, this um, uh, uh, stricture, biliary strictures, okay? Biliary is a polydocal cyst. There are cysts only in the, there are cystic diseases of the biliary channel, polydocal cyst, cyst in the biliary channel. There are different classification of the polydocal, Carolyn, um, that is the protonic classification, okay? In protonic classification, you will get is uh one so you have to these are other different diagnoses for you, okay? It sticks in the common bile duct, okay? Common CBD, post-surgery, post-polycystectomy, or tumor, or dynastasis, or magnesium, cyst, and anything. Other very much is PSC, primary sclerosing colon, that is other different diagnoses. Other is, is cholestatis can also in alcoholic hepatitis, alcoholic patient. Alcoholic patient may also have alcoholic hepatitis, patient have cholestatis also. Cholestatis viral hepatitis, means viral hepatitis have also cholesterol features. Like hepatitis A, E, or B, C, also cholesterol. Okay. And granulomatic hepatitis, other autoimmune hepatitis, adult bile, bile ductopenia means bile ductopenia means there is the bile duct uh, decline in the bile ducts. Okay. There are many causes. Okay. Sometimes the bile duct decline by drugs also, especially herbal drugs. Some patients taking herbal drugs for a long time, they have ductopenia. Okay. Positive of bile duct. So I have, we have seen one case also, the patient, this bile duct, um, ductopenia due to herbal medicines. Okay. So I, I'll, I always told you repeatedly the herbal medicine are not safe. Okay. Okay. You may be seen literature also, herbal tea, herbal supplements. Okay. Lip to do. They are all hepatotoxic. They are all banned drugs. Other condition is brick, benign recurrent intrahepatic cholesterol. This is a genetic disease. Brick. That there is benign recurrent it means patient has episode of cholestasis. Okay, patient journeys, raised alkaline phosphatase, and they subside itself. They brick also. This is brick. And there are drug, drug 
according to cholesterol there are many drugs like ciprexon tazobactams okay erythromycin osipins steroids they also possess bilirubin cholesterol jaundice or cholesterol hepatitis or these pictures so these are the common differential diagnosis there are certain diseases okay there are liver diseases there are drugs there are um, uh, autoimmune diseases so these are the differential diagnosis so at least you have to rule out this differential diagnosis by history examination and from investigations so this is the algorithm for diagnosis okay so algorithm so when the patient comes with this symptoms you do first the investigation you want to do is alkaline phosphate and ggt so alkaline phosphate is is a group of the enzymes okay they are always increase when there is bilirubin obstruction or bilirubin injury so raise alkaline phosphate and ggt and in case of this of this is obstructive jaundice or cholesterol jaundice in cholesterol you always get the bilirubin is raised also is conjugated bilirubin so when you get the pictures at least you have to rule out viral serology bnc if it is bnc you rule out and you take the history physical examination and ultrasound okay so in history if there is history of drug okay drug intake dili drug induced liver injury okay drug induced liver injury there is raise in alkaline phosphate ggt bilirubin and there is history of drug your diagnosis may be dili drug induced liver injury there are many drugs i have only told you okay like <clears throat> herbal medic medications or there are some antibiotics they may have response for the this elevated uh, bilirubin and alkaline phosphate okay one other is you will do ultrasound you will focal lesion or dilated bile duct ultrasound okay bile duct bile duct dilated intrahepatic bile duct dilated means there is obstruction in the uh, extrahepatic obstruction so they may be cbd stone may be structure so your diagnosis is type is okay so if the history so is of drug induced liver injury drug intake or mist or uh, imaging ultrasound shows the intrahepatic bile duct dilatation means there is obstructive jaundice okay this is not your uh, pbc okay then you go for the ama and ana most important ama and it might be anybody you can also go for ana and other are not that much common ntsp 100 ntgp 200 10 okay so i have told you earlier also okay uh nt um, so these antibodies okay so if this antibody are present okay history of polycystis okay raise or clinical ggt and antibody are present your diagnosis confirm means among three if two three are present your diagnosis is confirmed so serum antibody is present alkaline phosphate is also present means your diagnosis is established if they are negative means ama is also negative ana is also negative then you have to ultrasonography no abnormality then you can go for the further imaging studies like mrcp in the mri of the bilirubin canal like mrcp magnetic resonance cholangio pancreatography or plus minus endoscopic ultrasound so you know ultrasound graphy is you, you do you do from the externally you do externally ultrasound graphy but you can do ultrasonography endoscopically you do endoscope you do ultrasound it is better for especially for the bilirubin lesion pancreatic lesions okay so you do mrcp or needed endoscopic ultrasound in mrcp if you observe the the bilirubin channel are stenosis mean narrowing of the bilirubin channel and there is focal dilatation again narrowing beta depressions means this is a case of psc primary stenosis cholangitis uh, this is also negative normal in mrcp then you go for the liver biopsy okay in liver biopsy there is if, if there is evidence of liver disease like chronic hepatitis or the al alcoholic liver disease okay or wilson disease autoimmune disease or pbc also maybe so correct you, you can confirm your diagnosis of pancreatic disease or in or some kind of bilirubin lesion also you can diagnose bilirubin lesion also liver biopsy <laughs> and this is also a uh, negative thing uh other this is also normal liver biopsy you go for genetic test genetic testing there are many genetic diseases okay like autoimmune diseases wilson diseases alcohol deficiency you can go for genetic testing also so this is also negative means uh you can re evaluate the cases you can observe the cases observation and re evaluation okay so this is the algorithm for the cholestatic uh, liver biochemistry cholestatic feature if the um, patient comes with the raised alkaline phosphate ggt then you go like this <clears throat> now what are the um, 
pre detector for survival in PPC. Okay, what is the factor they are responsible for the survival? So basically, the survival um, pre detectors are clinical factors, laboratory factors, and histological factors. So among the clinical factors, age, okay, age is such, age advanced age is always an poor prognostic factors. Other are <coughs> poor prognostic factors are clinical means patient have decompensated fissure. Patient already have PBC related to the portal hyperin cirrhosis. Yes, with the patient only ascites, edema, HE, vaccine bleeding means that the patient already developed decompensated event. So if the patient have decompensated liver cirrhosis or decompensated event, the average survival is always, always one to two years. Okay. There are liver disease. One is compensated liver disease, other decompensated. Compensated means means liver cirrhosis without having ascites, having hepatic encephalopathy, varicell bleeding and jaundice. If the four these things are absent, that is compensated. When and the survival of this compensated liver is average with treatment is average 10 years, 9 to 10 years, or sometimes 10 to 12 years or so. But whenever the patient has compensated liver cirrhosis, develop decompensation even in the form of ascites, in the form of hepatic encephalopathy, GI bleeding, varicell bleeding, or jaundice, the survival is dramatically reduced to one to two years. So when the patient develops a decompensation event, always prepare for liver transplant. Okay. So the clinical, these are the factors. Laboratory factors are albumin level. Albumin, <coughs> the true liver function test is serum albumin level. Okay. Raised bilirubin, ALT, AC does not indicate severe liver disease. Severe liver disease always in the albumin profile type. Okay. The low albumin level. Serum alkaline phosphatase level, bilirubin level, prothrombin type. These are laboratory tests. There are, sub, there are evidence uh, supportive of poor prognosis. And histology, in histology, there is marked cholestasis, there is cirrhosis, fibrosis, okay, mandatory island bodies, there's the intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies. They are the histology predator poor prognosis. So this is the prognostic factors. So this is the gentilisma. You see the eye, there is the bodies in the lid, fat, fat, inside the subcutaneous tissues. In your palm, you see that this is the xanthomas. Okay, xanthoma in the palm, in bony tissue, elbows. These xanthoma are basically due to the uh, there, there is influx of this lipid fat in the uh, macrophages. The macrophages present in these tissues. Okay, there is a dysregulation of the export in influx export uh, influx and outflux of this this lipid droplet. Defective uh, in the macrophages may lead to this xanthomas. Now, natural history, the poor prognostic factor I have told you. Natural history, you know, there is silent disease, asymptomatic, symptomatic disease. And so, <clears throat> this is the prognosis. If the patient have asymptomatic, it is asymptomatic, as you know, the survival is good. And the median survival of the symptomatic patients, if the patient has symptomatic, the median survival is average 10 to 7 to 10 years in different studies. And it's 7 years for history, it is 3 and 4. It's the average survival in the symptomatic cases is seven to ten years. Okay, but if the patient have histological evidence of three or history four means means patient have history four means cirrhosis and history three means advanced fibrosis. The average survival is seven years, and the average survival of asymptomatic patients is around ten to sixteen years. Okay, okay, asymptomatic are slightly slightly higher. And the most asymptomatic patient develops symptoms usually within two to four years. So patients are asymptomatic, they are diagnosed PBC, they develop symptoms within two to four years. Okay. And the presence of titer or AMA does not influence the survival. Okay. So rise in AMA titer or decrease in the AMA titer does not correlate with the survival. The survival is other factor of survival is liver transplant. If the patient is symptomatic, if they go for liver transplant, the survival is high. So these are the survival, okay, average survival. Okay, asymptomatics 10 to 16 years, symptomatic 7 to 10 years. Now treatment, what is the treatment? Okay, up to slides. The treatment, the only one treatment for primary biliary cholangitis is UDCA, also DXC colic acid. This is the first drug. This is the only one drug that is supposed treatment for the also this colic acid, the treatment PVC. The dose is 13 to 15 milligram per kg per day. So average we do 15 milligram per kg per day. This is also deoxy colic acid. <clears throat> so how this UDC helps in PVC? <clears throat> so in hepatocyte, it acts on the hepatocyte, it acts on the cholangiocytes, in, in the ileocytes and monocytes. Okay. In hepatocyte, it stimulates biliary secretion of bile acids. Okay. Biliary secretion or bile acid. 
other in inhibit apoptosis okay apoptosis because apo if the apoptosis i have told you in, in pathophysiology pathogenesis apoptosis activate the again the this cd cells okay uh, pd cells pyruvate dehydrogenase complex okay and from this again uh, to the further cell so inhibit apoptosis also he activate gl glucocorticoid receptors also glucocorticoid receptors okay steroids and also a, re a reverse aberrant expression sla class 1 molecule is as you as you know that the sla is also also in pathogenesis of this um, this uh, uh, pbc so it reverse this expression of sla class 1 are in cholangiocyte it protect against the cytotoxicity of the hydro Obic bile acid. So bile acids are toxic, toxic substances. Okay, toxic. So they protect from this and possible anti-apoptotic effect also. Cholangiocyte, ileocyte inhibit bile acid carrier in ileocytes, ileum. In monocyte decrease cytokine secretions. So these are the mechanism, proper mechanism. How this also decipolicid is helpful in PVC. So PBC is the only drug, one drug that is that is also the survival benefit. If the, this is a chart. If it is 48 months after four years, if you the patients one patient one group of patient gives placebo and other placebo and then followed by UDC, other group UDC, the patient on UDC have okay survival benefit. Okay, those compared to those patients only have placebo. Okay, so if you diagnose PBC, you have to give this UDC. And you do say prolong the survival, and you do say also helpful in degree the symptoms and complication. So P uh, U D C. Okay, this is the drugs. Okay, survival benefit also. So apart from this U D C, there are there are other drugs. Okay, other drugs given in P B C, but these drugs are not very much helpful, not survival benefit. They have some um, um, uh, helpful in decreasing the minor symptoms, but they do not alter the course of disease. Okay. So this also I have already told you. Other drugs are colchicin, methotrexate, azathioprine, cyclosporin, steroids. Okay. So the, all of the, uh, these drugs are anti-inflammatory, immune-regulated drugs because the disease is immune-mediated. So the, all the drugs are given. <coughs> uh, 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 these are the immunosuppressive drugs. Okay. Colchicin, methotrexate, colchicin, uh, not immunosuppressive, anti-inflammatory. Anti, anti so these drugs are also these are really these are even in the past for these drugs have no any benefit in terms of uh, improving in the liver biochemistry in symptoms in relation symptoms and progression of liver disease. So these drugs are not given nowadays. But just to remember, the most important drug is also desipolic acid. Methotrexate, azathioprine, cyclosporine are not that much effective. Generally, not not given nowadays. So these are drugs and other drugs in pvc now trial is going on that is fxr agonist okay arsenoid x receptor agonist this is the under drugs given in pvc although these drugs are given other other condition also so basically it is a trial going on this pvc also so fxr agonist is a nuclear receptor uh, fxr is a nuclear receptor expressed in the liver kidney adrenal gland intestine so this FXR, there are receptors. This arsenoid X receptors are present in the liver cells, kidney cells, okay, adrenal gland, intestine, biliary channel also. And they how they help me? They help in bile acid metabolism, okay, bile acid metabolism, liver regeneration and inflammation. So this new newer drug, the, the drug name is obitopolic acids. Obitopolic acids. The dose is 10 milligram, 25 milligram, and 50 milligram. Maximum is 50 milligram per day, okay. And the <clears throat> this is the drugs. The side effect of the drug is that this side effect of pruritus, although the PBC have already pruritus, if you give the drug, the pruritus may be increases. Okay. So one side effect is pruritus, other is patient have side increase in the LDL level, cholesterol level. It's a newer drug. Now <clears throat> the we have given the drugs uh, for PBC. Now the PBC have polystasis, and this polystasis have uh, many effect in our body systems. That is pruritus. First important is pruritus. So, what are the drugs also um, drugs given for the polystasis associated pruritus? The drugs are polystyramine, rifampin, UDC also DC also helpful, naltrexone, and anti-histamine. These are the drugs. So, let's start from the polystyramine. So, in 
in this PVC, there is bile acid is very much high. The level of bile acid is very high. So, bile acid binding agents, they, buy, they bind the bile acids. Okay. So, the systemic absorption is less. So, side effect is less, less product. This is the drug is a polystyrene. <coughs> okay. So, this is the oral drug. The dose is only high dose, 3 to 4 gram, 30 minutes before meals and after 2 hours apart from UDCA. Okay. So, this is the drug, polystyrene. Other drug is rifampin. The dose is 150 to 300 milligram per day. Rifampin. So how rifampin help in mm, this uh, polystyrene induced prodiatus? Means rifampin is a, one is enzyme inducing agent. Okay, it induces the enzyme and it induces enzyme and it esc accelerate the esc excretion of this uh, the mm, excretion of the prodiatus the genetic agents. Okay, by enzyme inducing one factor. Other is if I'm saying inhibit the uptake of this bile acid by hepatocyte also. Okay. In this way, it decreases the refund, it decreases the pruritus. Also, DFC polyphase, okay, we already you know okay, no. Nanotransfer means it is the opioid antagonist. Opioid. So as you know that in this bile acid pool in our body, the opioid receptors are activated. And when opioid receptors are activated, they have give the sensation of pruritus. So, opiate antagonist, nitrogen. Other antihistamine. Antihistamine have no anti prorotic effect, but due to the sedative effect, sedation, that causes sedation, the, the side effect of this antihistamine may have some relief. Okay. So, these are the drugs given for the uh, polystatic uh, PVC. Okay. So, apart from the drugs, there are other therapies like ultraviolet light, ultraviolet light therapy. Plasma pharesis, okay. These are the other therapies, medical therapies. Other is liver transplant. If the patient intense prioritis, poor quality of life, you can go for the liver transplant. So, <clears throat> so now the treatment of PVC, uh, these uh, drugs, UDC, and the complication of uh, PVC means there is complication polystasis means one is prioritis, other is malabsorption, okay. So, malabsorption means this is this. Bile acid is responsible for the absorption of fat also, fat soluble vitamins also. Okay, fat soluble vitamins. So, what are the fat soluble vitamins? A, D, E, and K. Okay, so if this patient has this cholesterol liver disease, cholesterol jaundice, they have deficiency of these vitamins. So, you have to supplement this vitamin also, vitamin D. Okay, initially 25,000 to 50,000 interesting units once or twice a week. Vitamin A, okay, 1 lakh IU. For three days, then followed by 50,000 IU for 14 days. Oral vitamin K, 5 milligram per day. Vitamin E, 100 milligram daily. Okay. So these are the vitamins you give. Okay. To supplement if the patient has evidence of this vitamin deficiency. Okay. Other is istotoria. Istotoria means, <clears throat> okay. In case of uh, this, uh, this, means there is fat droplet in the feces. There is, this patient of PBC are unable to absorb fat. Is fat absorption also needed bile acids? Okay, bile acid. So in bile acid, there are bile salts. Okay, so when the lipid absorbed <coughs> by the intestine, okay, got small, small intestine, the lipid from the micelle formation with the bile salts. In the bile salts, have in good biochemistry, there is hydrophobic in hydrophilic in. Okay, so basically the lipid attached to the hydrophobic in. Okay, and they form the micelle, and the when the form the micelle. In the surface area of this fat is increases for the pancreatic lipase. Okay, and the pancreatic lipase absorbs or metabolizes this fat. Okay, and this fat further break down into the monosaccharides and further and they absorb to the villi and further in the intestine they again the esterification of the fat. Okay, occurs and they absorbs. Okay, so absorbs. So if there is bile salt deficiency, the absorption of the this fat is inhibited. Okay, absorption of fat. So there is loss of fat tissue, fat droplet in the stools, that is histotoria. Okay. So this patient cannot absorb fat. The fat is generally in the long chain fatty acid. In the food item food consume is basically long chain fatty fat, fats. Okay. So this patient should be given medium chain triglyceride. Okay, medium, medium chain. So they are easy to absorb. Easier. So medium chain triglyceride are also given in the patient in the form keto, you know, or the term keto diet. The patient, the group of the patient who want to reduce the weight, they also this take this medium chain triglyceride oil also. Okay, medium chain triglyceride. 
other is pancreatic replacement therapy so patient of um, this patient may have pancreatic enzyme deficiency so pancreatic enzyme can be given okay other is and this patient of primary biliary cholangitis patient have evidence of sibo what is sibo means small intestinal bacterial overgrowth okay means there are certain intestinal bacteria increases in the gut of the patient they also inhibit the uh, fat absorption so in this patient they get drugs oral drugs antibiotics okay there are many antibiotics and uh, quinones rifaximin okay local anti antibiotics so this is the antibiotic also given so if there evidence of hysteria they the patient should be avoided long chain triglyceride they should be medium chain triglyceride they should be replaced with pancreatic enzymes or antibiotic if there is evidence of sibo other is osteoporosis so osteoporosis osteoporosis this patient have more chances of osteoporosis fractures okay because there is altered uh, absorption altered metabolism of vitamin d also because this bile acid is needed for absorption of this um, uh, fat soluble vitamins so vitamin d level is also low and this may be related to the osteoporosis okay osteoporosis and vitamin d is also responsible for osteoclast activity you know osteoclast osteoclast activity okay so uh, so this osteoporosis also chances of being high in case of patient um, pbc so fracture is also high for so how you diagnose osteoporosis you have to do bone mineral density bone mineral density but a dexa scan okay dual x ray absolute dexa scan that is z score okay so you can diagnose the osteoporosis by dexa scan and this in, in female postmenopause you can use like hormone replacement therapy like estrogen replacement therapy okay in case of um, pbc patient menopause patient other is bisphosphonate and the bisphosphonate that is etidronate yellow dye etidronate i mean does okay so this this prospect also can be given in the patient of pbc the evidence if it is evidence of osteoporosis so this how this can help okay so you know i have told you osteoblast activity osteoblast osteoblast means new bone formation osteoclast means removal of the old bones okay so this this prospect in with the osteoclast activity okay? in this case it help osteoporosis other is hyperlipidemia 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 means there increase lipid in the body okay lipid fat cholesterol level is high okay so so uh, lipid lowering agent statin okay can you can give so one important thing is if there is hyperlipidemia there is increased chances of cardiovascular risk cerebral vascular risk is high okay but in this case of pbc the hyperlipidemia the chances of stroke and cardiovascular disease stroke is less because there is uh altered lipid metabolism there is lipoprotein x compound lipoprotein x is more there and this life could have anti-estrogenic activity this way the although the hyperlipidemia the risk of stroke and cardiac event are less and finally the liver transplant so liver transplant basically done in the end stage pbc that is complication of portal hypertension as you all know ascites advanced grade 3 ascites okay other complication of the cholesterol liver disease like poor quality life intense pruritus fatty muscle wasting so you can go the liver transplant if the liver transplant the survival one year survival is around 90 percent and five year survival is 80 percent here other thing is that if you go for liver transplant for pbc there is chances of recurrence also high and the recurrence is around zero to 35 percent so this is all about pbc okay this is the slide algorithms okay uh, i give you this slide you can further uh, review this okay this is all about pbc Thank you. 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 Thank you.